So we're going to cover um, a couple more case histories. And the two I'm going to talk about are the Katrina. Um, so what happened in New Orleans specifically during Katrina. And then the other one is Tom Sock Dam failure. So what do these two have in common? Um, not a lot other than they both happened in 2005. Uh, Katrina happened in August 2005. Tom Sock happened in... December of 2005. Okay, so let's start with Tom Sock Reservoir. It's uh, just south of St. Louis. Um, and the whole design for Tom Sock Reservoir is a pump back reservoir. So it's meant for uh, power generation during peak load times. And then during night, water gets pumped back up into the upper reservoir, and then peak load times, it gets, it gets released and generates power. So it's a little different than a lot of reservoirs out there in that it's on top of a hill, and it's a dike built around it, and it's perched up on, on top of a hill. And that's what it looked like um, back in early 2005. Here's a little bit of detail on the construction. You got the Rockfield Dike. Uh, there's a parapet wall there that's about 8 to 10 feet tall, depending on where you are. Um, monitoring instruments. You can see there's, there's a concrete line um, and the, the liner, but really what, what matters for this is that parapet wall and there's some instrument instrumentation. The idea is how this operates is it, it was all automated. Pumps back till it fills up. Uh, sensors tell it when to shut off. Um, and September 26th, uh, <coughs> the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, declared Tom Sock Dam an engineering milestone. Uh, the day before, because of this award they were getting, they had a bunch of people out there and they went out and it was on a Sunday and they observed water overtopping, which normally nobody would have been there on a Sunday, um, but just because they were getting this great award. They uh, had people out there and they're like, wait, that's, that's not good. Shut it, shut down the pump back um, and lowered the reservoir. So they, one of the operators, the main operator sent an email saying, okay, that's not good. You can read it here. It's obviously an absolute no, no. Water continued to spill over the top, cause a section to collapse and there would be all built downhill from there, literally. So be careful what you write in the emails because I might be talking about it 20 years from now. You never know. Um, so, <clears throat> what we're getting at here is that it was known, there was a known issue there. Um, and they went in and verified that the, the sensors were damaged and they changed the pump back thresholds and put in some fail safe sensors uh, so that it didn't happen in the future. But a couple months later, sensors failed to shut down the pump back operations. Overtop incurred at these four locations, um, but the primary location that ended up breaching is right, right here in red. Um, and this estimated <coughs> overflow at time, that's a weird way of saying it, it, it happened for about 10 minutes and, and 20 seconds of overflow before it breached and everything went downhill. So it was really quick. Here's a little show. It was 5.09 oh, yeah, 5 .09 in the morning when I started overtopping. Um, you got that start the erosion on the backside here. Again, this was about 8 to 10 feet tall, this parapet wall. And then just six minutes later, it's eroded enough that the wall section fails, falls over. And now you got a whole bunch of water flowing through there. And then the, most of the entire uh, embankment was gone by 525. So again, this is a really quick failure going from everything's fine, a little bit of overtopping, inch of overtopping, and 15 minutes later, the whole embankment's gone. This is what that breach looked like. Here's from standing in the reservoir. You can kind of see what that looks like there. <coughs> 
Here's an aerial view showing this, the, the path of the, the floodway, what it did to the terrain there, it kind of just wiped everything out in its path. Um, remember, this is up on top of a hill, so it, it's going downhill pretty quick right here. This is another aerial view from further away, showing the before um, and the after the breach there and the water goes down. Most of the inundation was contained in the lower reservoir, so um, there were no additional damages further downstream. It really was focused right in here. Okay, so this is something we talked about earlier, and this is uh, something that could be very significant for this area, is the seasonal aspects of a lot of what we're doing. In this case, it was December, um, but downstream of there is this place called the Johnson's Shut-In State Park, which is a weird name. I don't know where you, does anybody know the history of that name? No. Shut-ins is where rocks, <coughs> shut -ins are where rocks are exposed. It's like what they were yeah. Okay. It's not about certain, okay, it's not about people. All right, that helps a lot. So it's, it has to do with the, the geology. Um, okay, so it's a popular place in the summer. There would be people out there swimming. There'd be a lot of activities going on. Winter, not so much. So the population at risk was, was five for the winter and probably around 400 for the summer. So we had, time, we had a couple of these conversations in smaller groups, but if you're doing some sort of a risk assessment where you're thinking about this, you need to understand the seasonal aspects. And there's a couple things to consider. One is where people might be, or how many people might be there, right? But the other thing would be, does the um, number of people, is that correlated with the potential for having a large storm event, right? If you're worried about major flood events leading to breaching or overtopping, and your rainy season's in the winter when nobody would be out there, um, then you need to, that's a big part of understanding the risk. In this case, it had nothing to do with the rainy season, so that's not an issue here. But you would still, if you're doing a risk assessment on this, you'd say, all right, for a big chunk of the time, my population at risk is going to be a lot higher, and you need to weight your risk accordingly. Okay, <clears throat> so what actually happened, it was December 12th, population risk of five, zero warning. Um, all five of those lived in right downstream in the same house. The house was washed off the foundation. Uh, population risk, like I said, is the same as the exposed and life loss is zero. So here's some more detailed photos of what happened. <clears throat> you can see that the cars over here, so this gives you some scale on how big of this floodway was. Um, you can start to see here's the foundation up close, right? So people are in this house, 5, 10 in the morning. Next thing you know, house and everybody in it is washed down the street. Um, it was the superintendent of the shut-in in Tom Sock State Park. His wife and three children were, were swept away. They were all found at various places downstream, um, but all survived. And the biggest issue was really some one of the children were, was, received severe burns when they had heat packs applied, treating them for, for hypothermia. Right? So, when we start talking about <coughs> the factor of luck, of how all of them survived, that's, that's a hard thing to think through. We don't have the details of, of exactly what happened. Um, but remember, when we talk about this high hazard, this is one of those points where there's a group of five people, fatality rate of, of zero. And that's a rare-ish occurrence but, occurrence, but it's not impossible. So that, that's a good point. Um, and Woody addressed this a little bit yesterday or the day before about the road networks aren't preloaded. So the only way the road networks in LifeSim get loaded is by evacuating people from the structures that are in your, your um, project area. So the way you can do this is put in some fake structures at different road inlets into the study area and start the warnings there a little bit earlier so you start seeing flow of people and you can with the idea that they're from outside the levee area right you start to worry about double counting maybe because maybe people that are going through there are the ones that are actually supposed to be in the buildings in your study area but that's a major concern for something like this uh, you could do that and i think 
for something like this, or if you have a, a dam and right downstream of that is a major freeway, and those are the ones that ultimately are going to be most at risk for some sort of surprise event where they can't close the road, you have to do something to account for people being on that road. You can't just say, well, life sim said there's nobody there, so we're, we're good, right? You got to do something for that. Good comment, though. Okay, <clears throat> and this is what Tom Sock looks like today. You can still see the, the flood scar, um, but it, it was replaced completely with RCC, roller compacted concrete. Okay, now um, moving on to Katrina. Katrina is one that we um, always, I always want to keep in this into our, our case histories. Um, the, the, Eric Halpin, the person who set up the risk management center, the reason I have the job I do. His second day at headquarters as the, the head of dam and levee safety, um, Katrina occurred and it really changed the, the future of our agency, especially with related to, to levee safety and understanding potential loss of life became a much bigger focus of what we do. Um, so <clears throat> this really is an, ha had an impact on um, the way we talk about life loss and risk and Congress looked at the Corps of Engineers after Katrina and said hey um, we got to do better and they gave us a lot of leeway to really make some significant changes in how our organization works um, nationalizing some of the centers so there's more consistency across the nation and good and bad whatever you think of that I know there's a lot of core employees that may or may not like that um, but overall this led to a lot of shifts in how we do business. It's an important thing to, to remember. Okay, so before we jump in, I'm, I have some questions I want you to start thinking about. Is one, was Katrina uh, predictable? Is, uh, was there any thoughts about, hey, this is gonna, this is a risk we're looking at, this could be very significant. Um, were there studies related to that that we know it might happen? Um, how effective was the evacuation? We've already talked about that. You have an idea of what the evacuation was. In your mind, do you think that's really effective, not so good, or, or somewhere in between? Uh, what led, in this specific case, to people not evacuating? We saw for Oroville what led to it, but what, what's different about Katrina? Uh, how many people died during Katrina? What, what percentage of the population at risk ended up losing their life? These kind of numbers are, are good to have in the back of your head. Just because if somebody shows up and says, hey, here's my life loss estimate, and it's 50% or 0.0001%, if it's outside the bounds of some of what you know, and that's why we do these case histories all, all, all around is, once you get, start to get a feel for, hey, here's the range that I'm used to seeing based on historic events, you're way outside that, I want to have some, some good reasoning as to why you think it's going to be way better or way worse. And then what were the driving factors? Was it <coughs> direct versus indirect, warning time versus evacuation percentage, um, was it the flood characteristics? What really mattered in, in Katrina? So the first one, predictable. A couple studies that came up. Uh, shortly before Katrina in 2002, the local newspaper, five-part series, Washing Away. Um, so again, what we were talking about, how do you get the public to understand that you might be at risk? You can have all these public education campaigns, then they have mixed results in terms of actually getting that public um, aware. But they said 200,000 um, residents would not be able to evacuate, and between 25,000 and 100,000 people would die. But this was a big series in the local newspaper a couple years before the event. And then there was another exercise that looked at a fictitious PAM. Um, slow moving category three hurricane passes just west of New Orleans, 20 foot storm surge overtops levees and inundates the entire city. 1.1 million would experience long term displacement. 400,000 suffer injury or illness. Over 60,000 people would perish. That was just the year before. So there were lots of concerns about this, lots of conversations about it. Um, but again, trying to get 
the population that lives there to really tune in is hard, um, just when you're talking about studies and what might happen. That was people doing using the information they had at time um, without, yeah. So I haven't read that actual study to figure out why they would get to, how did they get to 60,000 or, or 25,000 to 100,000? That's a pretty large number, but uh, I'm not sure how they got there. Okay, the actual timeline, uh, August 25th, hurricane went through my, uh, Miami area. Category one, there were some fatalities there. Then it went back out into the Gulf of Mexico, um, strengthened, and then ultimately when it hit New Orleans, it was a category three. In this case, you're gonna see 1,800 fatalities. Um, the, those estimates are, there's a pretty big range there. 1853, I think is what Wikipedia says. That there's a, it's hard to really pinpoint the exact number especially based on what we talked about this morning, where you start thinking about indirect life loss, 1853 includes some estimate of indirect life loss. So there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Um, the actual flooding that occurred is two hours prior to landfall. Um, you had a surge out here that came into the uh, industrial canal and overtopped the levees into North Orleans East Bowl and Orleans Bowl. Um, and then you had some breaches right here at St. Bernard Bowl. And this was right into the Lower Ninth Ward. This is where you saw a lot of the, the really high severity flooding and a lot of the really bad uh, damage and a lot of the life loss was there. Um, but there, there was a lot of the city ended up being flooded. Um, the evacuation, initial orders were given early on Saturday, um, a stage hurricane evacuation. They did convert I-10 to contraflow, um, but it was still really, really gridlocked. Um, but it was a couple days in advance, so, so that was good. Um, on Sunday, it was category five. They were a lot more certain that it was bearing down on the city, and they started ordering the mandatory evacuation, right? So <clears throat> it'll likely topple our levy system. So this is good, good um, uh, communication here. This one, I think, is a little bit less... It took some of the focus off of what we really should have been worried about, right? That's not the real issue, is that the oil and gas industry is going to be struggling. Um, the real issue is that a whole bunch of people might die, and that's what the focus of that messaging really should have been on to get people moving. Okay. So by landfall, 630,000 vehicles have fled using the primary, um, 10 to 30,000 using secondary roads. 1.1 million people evacuated. We saw that number earlier, right? They, pre they predicted 1.1 million would be displaced for a long time. They had 1.1 million people evacuated. Or like we said, reinforcing that 80 to 90%. Um, so 80 to 90%, does anybody remember what the percentage for Oroville was? Yeah, it was, I think it was 75 and 83, depending on which um, of the two counties or the, the survey areas we were looking at. So that, that's not a bad percentage. And if you look at a lot of the historic events, that's not bad. I always get all the hurricanes mixed up. But I think after Katrina, Rita came through shortly thereafter, right? Um, and they got a 95% evacuation rate. And you can say, well, that's really good, but there's a couple things to think about. One, they just had a huge hurricane that went horribly wrong, and so everybody was very aware. And two, a big percentage of people hadn't come back. So those that were more mobile are the ones that were coming back and ready to leave again. So why didn't they leave? This is a little bit different. This was the big one that was pointed out was there's nowhere to go. It was the end of the month. People live in paycheck to paycheck, didn't have any money. so that made it much less likely that they were going to say, or much more likely that they're gonna to try to write it out rather than, than try to figure out a way to, to pay for getting out of there. A Little bit on this previous experience. So you combine those two and you're more motivated to stay there. Hey, we've been told this before. Maybe the messaging wasn't as good as it should be, right? So 
Um, between these two things, that's what we talked about yesterday, this cry wolf, if you have some warnings for evacuations that haven't played out in the past, you've got to be really good about that messaging. Um, but between those two things and all this combined, that had a lot to do with understanding of why people didn't leave. Nursing homes was another big one, 21 of 57 evacuated. Um, so nursing homes typically have their own evacuation plans. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but a lot of times when it comes to, if a nursing home has to evacuate, you're relying on the staff that work there to get people out. And it'll either be with their own vehicles or if the nursing home has a couple buses, it'll be using that. So. That's typically the evacuation plans for, for most of the nursing homes. So that's why you see only a smallish percentage. Um, there's another thing, this idea of what's the difference between a voluntary evacuation and a mandatory evacuation? Anybody? For a mandatory, you have to leave. Yeah. That's what it sounds like, right? Um, but in, in reality, there's, we can't make anybody leave. So I think in some, some states, the uh, officers can go in and take the kids out if they're under 18, under like a mandatory evacuation. I don't think that's gonna happen either. So it's really all about messaging, voluntary versus mandatory. A lot of cities, municipalities have um, in their evacuation plans, if a voluntary evacuation is ordered, that's when those that need extra help, like people in nursing homes, will start moving people. And that's how they've started to, to plan better for those that need help. All right, if we get to the point where we're under what we call a voluntary evacuation, we're gonna get those that need extra assistant moving so that when it really gets dire and we issue the mandatory, they're already out of the way. A lot of them moved to <coughs> schools and the Superdome. I'm sure a lot of you saw that if you were following the news. Um, and then in the five days that followed, 62,000 rescues from people that were stranded. But a lot of those ended up in the shelters that led to a bunch of additional problems in those shelters. So here's some life loss summary. Again, another number for the how many people lost their life. I talked about the research from um, Dr. Boss Jankman of the Netherlands who did this for his uh, masters. So they came up with some pretty detailed numbers out of uh, what happened in New Orleans. Um, so of 771 fatalities, one third of those were outside the inundated area. So probably not um, direct fatalities, right? That you can't say that for sure. It could have been they, they drowned and then somebody moved them outside the inundated area and that's where they were recovered. But for the most part, they were in hospitals and shelters. <clears throat> so one third of them died there, and then two thirds were assumed to be direct physical impacts of the flooding. So on the question, I, I think there's been a little confusion because I think Jesse said something slightly different this morning. Um, but for based on this information, um, it was about 60% of the population lost their life due to direct impacts of the flooding and about 40% for indirect. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about this a lot where the elderly, 60% of them were over 65 years old. And then as we've talked about the higher fatality rates near the breaches. And that was significant in some, some locations where, where you got those higher depths and velocities and, and the structures were washed away. Here's some of the recovery locations in the inundated area. Um, some were in residential, some were in the medical and shelters, um, some inside the inundated area, some outside the inundated areas. <clears throat> so what, what else did we know? Um, income level was a factor. Disease and toxic contamination was not. So we talked about that first one already, income level, people that were struggling for the income um, had lower propensity to leave. But something we heard a lot on the um, news, at least I remember hearing at the time, all that 
water that was sitting there for a long time as they waited to pump it out. They were worried about it being full of toxins and, and diseases. Um, future or further research showed that that didn't really uh, contribute to the life loss there. But there was a lot of pro prolonged exposures of people that were trying to stay above the water, went into their attics, um, and a lot of them got trapped in their attics. It was really hot, and they couldn't get out of there, and that led to a lot of problems in life loss. Uh, but same thing <clears throat> in shelters and even on high grounds. Maybe you remember the pictures of people on overpasses, um, just on, on roads that were high ground, and waiting for people to rescue them or bring them water. And they were sitting out there in the hot sun, and that led to a lot of additional life loss. <clears throat> So I talked about this earlier. We're talking about indirect life loss again. Um, it ha when you start the evacuation, you can get life loss of people just preparing for the event, right? So we'll go back to the indirect life loss. The evacuating group and the non-evacuating group started to see some accidents or a nursing home patients died during an evacuation, most likely from, from dehydration. A lot of more talk about the, the bodies found in nursing homes and hospitals in New Orleans, um, and then this Memorial Medical Center where 45 um, bodies were recovered. Again, I think, yeah, if you haven't read this book and you're interested in this kind of information, it's, it's depressing, um, but the decisions that the doctors had to make to try to keep these people comfortable and, and in some cases help them die so that they didn't sit there and suffer because they knew that was going to be the end result. Um, but that's a tough situation to be in and there are a lot of lawsuits afterwards and a lot of blame going around and that's what is covered in here and it, it's a, it is an interesting read. Um, so we talk about the Superdome, six, were, six deaths were confirmed there with four of these from natural causes, one from drug overdose and one a suicide. Um, so natural causes, but they're all related to the, the event that occurred and them having to move into that, uh, the Superdome. So whether, I mean, we could talk all day about whether those natural causes, I mean, maybe that person was going to have a heart attack anyway that day and this just happened to be there. Yeah. You can't really back that up. Driving factors, um, death and velocity were, were driving factors. There was no correlation with rate of rise. So the work that Bas Jonkman had done over in the Netherlands for their similar event that happened in 1953, he had a high correlation in the, uh, the death rates with the rate of rise of water. And a lot of that has to do with just how much time you have to get out of the way. But that wasn't correlated at all in, in the work he did here. Um, <clears throat> that's why you don't see it in a lot of the, uh, the life loss estimates that we're doing. But back to that question I asked at the beginning is what percentage of the population at risk ended up losing their life? Overall, as a whole, and this, this is important to say, this is for direct, right? This, in col this column here includes the number of people in residential locations. Um, special facilities such as hospitals and shelters are not included as they're not expected to be related to flood characteristics. So talking about direct life loss, as a percentage of the par overall, or about 1% for Katrina. So that's always a good thing to have just in the back of your head. Population at risk, what happened in Katrina was about 1% for that direct life loss. Just, just keep that in the back of your mind. So 1% of exposed or that's 1% of the overall um, population, if I did that right. Is that right? No. Dang it. It's 1% of the uh, exposed. You're right. It's 0.01% of the total population at risk. Thank you. 1% of the exposed. Okay, this one's a little bit more straightforward. Oh, sorry, it's hard to see that. Um, so here's your hydrograph. But putting this in, into that idea of what's going on, um, you had that stage voluntary evacuation that I mentioned, and then it, the forecast changed and the mayor issued mandatory evacuation orders, and then the overtopping and breaching occurred. You had about a day 
prior to the mandatory that you had that state voluntary evacuation then about another day before the water showed up so that gives you an idea of how much time people had to evacuate and we achieved about a 90 percent 80 to 90 percent evacuation rate. some other things so we had talked about economics just now let's talk about um, some other <laughs> damages right so costliest hurricane um, was Katrina and this was even including Harvey and then oil spills so talking about the environmental impacts of something like this um, there are some, some significant damages in that so when you're talking about these major events when you're talking about you have a bunch of industrial facilities it, we have the information available to at least know what critical infrastructure would be in the way and if you're talking about something like a nuclear power plant you can't just ignore it you doing a consequence estimate you think there's a nuclear power plant in the potential inundation zone you got to talk about it and talk about what the con consequences of that um, might be um, it did displace over a million Houston Texan <laughs> Houston had an increase of 35,000 people Mobile 24 Baton Rouge 15 um, so a lot of people left the city and never came back. That was one of the big impacts on, on New Orleans. So, so displaced was not a temporary condition, you're saying they just... A lot of them never came back, right? Never came back. Right. So there were about, it was less than half. So in January 2006, which is only a, a month later, or no, it's five months later, because it happened in August, um, Less than half of the people were there, and a big chunk of those, like I said, never came back. So the entire state showed a population decline almost a year later of, of 5%. Five, 5 okay, so that's the last case history. Um, again, the reason why we do these is trying to just give you this stuff in the back of your mind when you see a consequence estimate for a specific type of inundation whether it's a flash flood whether it's a, a dam breach whether it's a levee breach related to a hurricane or not you have something in the back of your mind to say well this is what's happened in the past this is what i'm seeing why is it better or worse and that's that's i don't think we can't stress that enough how much we would like you to go in and do that and I know I've said, okay, the reclamation approach doesn't fit our needs and we think it's limited in many ways, but if you go and look up the reclamation approach online, they have a really nice case history document that summarizes a, a ton of case histories that's really consumable. Um, so I would recommend you, you go out and do that. 